President, Nobel Lord Al Gore, Excellencies, friends of planet Earth. Welcome to the University of Oslo, to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum, and to the Oslo Peace Days. In 2015, the United Nations Member States adopted the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, including 17 Sustainable Development Goals. The SDGs provides a holistic and comprehensive framework for development. They are interconnected, intertwined, and they require that we cooperate to solve them. In the UN agenda, it is stated that it will be for all of us to ensure that the journey to sustainable development is successful. All of us. That means you and me, my friends. We. The question is, of course, how? When people or politicians ask me about the return of its investment or the impact of the University of Oslo, uh, my response is clear. It is our strong research-based education. It's our students. After all, we educate the candidates that through history has filled and in future will fill the positions in the big and responsible we. In order to succeed, they must contribute to society, both with a skilled set of, set of skills and, importantly, a value set that supports a sustainable planet Earth, the key for a big we to succeed. Clearly, there are dilemmas with the SDGs. How do we approach the, trans the, the tension between the goals? How do we balance economic growth and combating climate change? Yesterday, Dennis McQuaig connected new renewable energy technology and the human suffering resulting from cobalt being mined in Congo. Dilemmas, problems, challenges that must be solved. Problems to be solved by the big we. The Nobel Peace Prize Forum is a collaboration between the Norwegian Nobel Institute and the University of Oslo. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce the director of the Nobel Institute, Dr. Olaf Jelsta. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, or as Dr. Dennis Mukherjee said it last uh, yesterday, dear friends of peace. When the Nobel Peace Prize for 2007 was being announced in October of that year, the chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, the late Professor Ole Dan Holt Mjøs, said about today's keynote speaker, Mr. Al Gore has for a long time been one of the world's leading environmentalist politicians. His strong commitment reflected in political activity, lectures, films and books, has strengthened the struggle against climate change. He is probably the single individual who has done most to create greater worldwide understanding of the measures that need to be adopted. And Professor Mjöss went on to say, Action is necessary now, before climate change moves beyond man's control. Ladies and gentlemen, both statements still hold true. Mr. Gore is as forceful and impatient as ever in his struggle to save the environment. But the climate crisis remains unsolved. Global emissions of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases are as high as ever and may be increasing again after a brief halt. This is why the organizers of this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum have decided to invite Mr. Gore back to Oslo in order to reflect upon three big questions. After all these years, why haven't we achieved more in terms of solving the climate challenge? 
Is there still some precious time left before climate change moves irreversibly beyond man's control? If so, what are the most urgent actions to be made in the years to come? Ladies and gentlemen, it is a true honor to give the floor to former U.S. Vice President and Nobel Peace Prize laureate, Mr. Al Gore. Please join me in giving him a warm applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's such an honor to be with you and an honor to be invited to return here to this city and to give this address to the Nobel Peace Prize Forum. Uh, I want to thank uh, Olaf Njolstad, the Nobel Institute uh, Director, uh, Sivine uh, Sterling, uh, the Rector of the University of Oslo, uh, Raymond Johansson, uh, the Governing Mayor of Oslo, uh, Liv uh, Tortis of the Nobel Institute uh, Peace Center, and I wish to acknowledge uh, as a group the members of the Norwegian Nobel Committee, and I wish to congratulate the committee on their uh, wise choice that led to yesterday's uh, inspiring ceremony. It was a magnificent uh, statement that the world must not only recognize but accept global responsibility for ending sexual violence and sexual violence as an instrument of war. Uh, Nadia Murad and Dennis Mukwege uh, are such uh, inspiring individuals. These issues must receive not only global attention but uh, determined follow-up. The committee has played a unique role in focusing the world's attention on matters of conscience, on matters of security, on matters that affect the human future. For many years, until the change was made in 1990, the ceremony took place in this magnificent hall. But as the uh, prominence of the committee's uh, judgment and the significance of the award grew uh, over the years, that naturally the audience uh, grew and it was moved then to uh, City Hall. I remember so vividly uh, 11 years ago, uh, it was the greatest honor of my life, of course, to receive the award in tandem with the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Some members of the IPCC are here, and I very much look forward to the discussion of the distinguished panel after these uh, remarks, and then I look forward to joining uh, Old Torp for uh, an interview on stage uh, after that. In 2007, I returned from uh, Oslo. I went to Bali for the climate negotiations that were then underway. Uh, and tonight I will leave for Katowice, where the negotiations for this year's Conference of the Parties are underway. But when I finally returned back to my home in Tennessee, uh, where I live in the city of Nashville, but spend a great deal of time on my farm 50 miles away in the small town of Carthage, where I grew up, it has only 2,000 people. Uh, but it was very proud in 1945 when one of its uh, residents, its most distinguished resident, Cordell Hall, received uh, the Nobel Peace Prize uh, and was described by President Franklin Delano Roosevelt as the father of the United Nations. He was the author of the General Agreement uh, on Trade and Tariffs. He sponsored the constitutional amendment creating a, an income tax in the U.S. in the early part of the 20th century. And the small newspaper that serves the 2,000 people of 
Carthage, Tennessee, put my, the honor I had received here in Oslo in perspective for me with the headline on the front page that said, Gore wins same prize Hull won. <laughs> and I want to say uh, one more word about the IPCC. It was just uh, insulted, really, by uh, the governments of the United States uh, and Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia. Uh, because uh, when the governments were called upon to welcome the latest report of the IPCC two days ago, those three nations, along with Kuwait, refused to do so. And because uh, the body uh, that governs the climate negotiations operates by consensus, they were not able to welcome the report. It was uh, for the three largest producers of petroleum on the planet to choose a word uh, inconvenient to welcome the actual scientific facts. So I thought this might be an appropriate uh, occasion to take stock of the big changes that have occurred over these last 11 years. The first change um, is that the crisis, the climate crisis, is growing worse rapidly. And it is growing worse more rapidly than the world is developing and implementing solutions. We have what can only be described as a global emergency. The phrase, uh, all hands on deck, applies. Every nation, every business, every city and regional government, every civic organization should be mobilizing urgently to radically reduce the emissions of man-made heat trapping global warming pollution. I will turn to the good news in a moment. A preview is that the second big change has been the surprising emergence of solutions that are available. But I want to spend a few more moments on the fact that it, the crisis is growing worse. Outside of the door to this building, uh, there is a demonstration of what one ton of CO2 looks like. We all saw it uh, coming into the building. Imagine 110 million of those tons being released into the atmosphere every 24 hours. You don't have to imagine that is what we are doing. That is what we will do again today. And there is a common misperception of the true nature of the sky into which these 110 million tons are daily spewed. It is not the vast and limitless expanse that appears to our eyes as we stand on the ground and look up at it in wonder. It is, in fact, a very thin shell of atmosphere surrounding the planet. The late Carl Sagan used to say, if you had a large globe with a coat of varnish, the thickness of that varnish relative to the globe is equivalent to the thinness of the atmosphere that surrounds our planet. 
110 million tons of man-made heat-trapping global warming pollution added to that thin shell every single day, day in and day out, mounts up. And the molecules stay there for a very long time. Some say a thousand years, but they say that because the mathematics are complicated and uh, a certain percentage uh, falls out sooner than that, a tiny percentage stays longer than that. But think of its residence time as a thousand years. The cumulative amount in the atmosphere today traps as much extra heat energy in the Earth's system as would be released by 500,000 Hiroshima-class atomic bombs exploding every day. Hard to imagine that amount of energy. It's a big planet on which we live, but that's an extraordinary amount of heat energy. And it is radically changing the climate balance, the water cycle, the fate of living species on this earth, the course of human civilization, and humanity's future as a species. The evidence is very clear, and indeed some of the evidence is being delivered to us by Mother Nature. The scientists have renewed uh, their uh, warnings in ever more urgent language in the report that was not officially welcomed in Poland. The scientists in the United States have just completed the U.S. National Climate Assessment. The Global Carbon Project just released its report on emissions that deliver the disturbing news that after three years of stabilized emissions, this, this year, they reported on the first nine months, there has been a 2.7 percent increase following a 1.6 percent increase last year. But the messages from Mother Nature may have more impact. Ninety-three percent of all that extra heat energy is going into the oceans, and the oceans are reflecting it back at us in the form of much stronger and more destructive cyclonic storms, hurricanes, typhoons, as well as cyclones, all the same phenomena with different names in different ocean basins. We are seeing wildfires like the ones in California in the American West this year. The fire season has increased by 105 days per year. There were fires here in Scandinavia this year. In fact, uh, six of the fires in Sweden were north of the Arctic Circle. There were fires in many places. Because the same extra heat that warms the oceans also warms the land and dries the land out. And as I mentioned, the water cycle is disrupted because the amount of water vapor that comes off the oceans increases as the temperatures of the ocean increase. That water vapor is carried by atmospheric rivers that are often 30 times larger than the Mississippi River, the largest in North America. And when it comes over the land and encounters meteorological conditions that trigger a downpour, the downpours are much larger. Rain bombs is the phrase some meteorologists are using now. And they lead to much more destructive floods and mudslides. And the combination of disruptive changes in the precipitation patterns punctuated by longer, more severe periods of drought is disrupting agriculture and disrupting other important human activities. 
the increase in temperatures themselves uh, have an impact. This year will be among the fifth hottest years in history. The four hottest were the last four. 17 of the 18 hottest have been in the last 18 years. I was in Finland uh, two weeks ago, and during the extraordinary heat spell in Finland this summer, many people went to the local grocery stores to lie in the aisles near the cooling of the dairy products. And the grocers were very kind to allow them to make camp there each night. I could give many more examples, but the examples that come from developing countries are ones that should capture our attention. The heat is now combining with higher humidity, which on a global average has increased 5% in the last 30 years, to create a, a heat index or a feels-like temperature that is close to exceeding the boundaries of conditions in which human beings can live. In several locations in the Middle East and North Africa, the combination of heat and humidity has already uh, episodically exceeded 74 degrees. No human being can live outdoors for more than a few hours in such conditions. And we learn from the scientists who specialize in these matters that large areas of the Middle East and North Africa, some parts of India, some parts of China, some parts of Central America, may become functionally uninhabitable. The word is worth repeating, uninhabitable. When an area becomes uninhabitable, the people who are living there leave and they seek shelter elsewhere. There are more refugees in the world today than at any time since the immediate aftermath of World War II. And there are many causes for the flows of refugees, civil wars and violence, the kind of violence in the Congo that was discussed earlier and yesterday. But it is abundantly clear that the fastest growing cause of refugees is the climate crisis. In Syria, for example, long before the civil war broke out in Syria and opened the gates of hell, the worst drought, a climate-related drought, the worst drought in the 900 years of record keeping in the Eastern Mediterranean killed 80% of the goats and other livestock in Syria, destroyed 60% of the farms, and drove one and a half million climate refugees into the cities of Syria, causing the ministers of that country in conversations reported through the WikiLeaks mechanism, I hate to mention their name, uh, but they printed some interesting uh, information. Uh, and the Syrian ministers said before the civil war, we cannot handle this. All hell is going to break loose. And the civil war started soon thereafter. Most of the refugees went to neighboring countries and they have borne that burden with dignity and fortitude. But the minor share came to Europe and contributed along with other factors to the growing wave of populist authoritarianism. Even the drama unfolding in London uh, this week has a connection. One of the two most powerful billboards installed by the pro-Brexit forces showed an endless line of refugees, obviously from the Middle East and North Africa, heading toward the borders of Europe. And the slogan 
was, the EU has failed us all. In my country, in the elections just passed, um, President Trump uh, attempted to make a huge issue of the so-called caravan of migrants from Central America to the borders of the U.S. where they sought to request asylum. And in several interviews with these migrants, they said, we're fleeing violence. But the story is more complicated. The isthmus of Central America uh, is perhaps the most vulnerable geography in the world to the climate crisis. Indeed, uh, there is an annual vulnerability, climate vulnerability index and this year, number one on the list is the nation of Honduras. Number five out of 140, 184 nations is Guatemala. The dry corridor that covers parts of five countries in Central America is the region from which these refugees are leaving. Many of these families have not had a harvest in over a year, some in two years. They're hungry. And the predictions are that many millions of others will be driven by these new climate conditions to leave the lands their ancestors have always called home. The destabilizing impact of these climate refugees for the stability of political systems in the world has not been featured very frequently in the analyses of the dangers associated with the climate crisis. But they do impose uh, a threat to global security. There are many other consequences which I won't take the time to elaborate, but studies just in the last few weeks have highlighted the growing rate of ice loss in both Greenland and Antarctica, and Antarctica, with areas of East Antarctica long thought to be safely stable now added to West Antarctica as a source of sea level rise. We are a coastal species in the main. And the number of cities and islands and towns and low-lying areas like the Bangladesh Delta that will suffer tragedies as a result of sea level rise is a long list. Tropical diseases are moving. And biologists will alert us to their strong belief that by far the most serious consequence of the climate crisis is the loss of biodiversity. We have already seen in the last few decades the loss of half of all the animals on this planet. Not species, half of all the animals, gone. We now face the risk of half of all the living species disappearing by the end of this century. How do we receive that news? What sense of moral responsibility do we feel when faced with the news that on our watch, those of us alive during this moment when the hinge of history is swinging, well, perhaps if there was an organized campaign to cast doubt on the truth of the scientists' work, we would not have to even think about shouldering responsibility. That's what's been going on. That's what's going on in Poland today and this week. It is a disgrace. And the judgment of history will be extremely harsh, of course. But we can't wait for history's judgment. 
because we have urgent business before us, all of us. That brings me to the second of these two big changes in the last 11 years. We have the solutions available. It is actually stunning to take stock of how quickly the price of renewable energy has plummeted Some of us were startled when computer chips came down in price at a rate that no one could have imagined was possible. Mobile telephones, flat screen TVs, the list is a long one. And some areas of technology we now realize follow rules that are different from those that governed the industrial age. Things get cheaper and better quickly. And the good news is that has happened with renewable energy. It is happening now with batteries. Uh, It has happened with LED light bulbs. The price has declined 94% uh, just in less than uh, 10 years. It's happening with green buildings. It must happen as well with sustainable forestry and sustainable agriculture. We must recarbonize the soils and we must recognize that the best technology we know of to remove CO2 from the atmosphere is called a tree. And when that technology is taken to scale, it is called a forest. (laughs) And we can hope that clever scientists and technologists and engineers will come up with new devices that could actually remove the CO2 from the atmosphere with efficiencies that exceed that of trees and forests. But we can't wait. And yet we're losing one football field's worth of forest every second worldwide. And the wave of populist authoritarianism that I referred to earlier has now spread to Brazil with feared consequences for the Amazon. In any case, we do have solutions available to us today. They can be implemented. They are being implemented. In my country, the fastest growing job is solar installer. Those jobs are growing nine times faster than other jobs in the U.S. economy. In fact, the famous Coal Museum in Kentucky uh, just installed solar panels on its roof to (laughs) save money for its annual operating budget. The second fastest growing job is wind turbine technician. It seems obvious to me and to some others that the world is now in the early stages of a sustainability revolution based in part on the new digital tools of the Internet of Things and machine learning and artificial intelligence and a host of other technologies giving executive teams in business and industry the ability to handle electrons and atoms and molecules and cells and genes with the same precision the IT businesses have demonstrated in their skill at managing bits of information. And we see these changes sweeping the global economy. We need a circular economy because in addition to to transforming agriculture and forestry, we have to transform industry with circular supply loops that reuse waste. And it's not impossible to do. All of these are changes that will benefit humanity in multiple ways aside from saving our future. We can use it to create employment at a time when the secular economy needs increased demand. Investors are helping to lead the way as well. 
And uh, I wish to acknowledge the presence in this audience of uh, Ingva Slingstad from the Norwegian Bank and the presence of a good many other investors who have integrated sustainability into their investment models. I hope that the nation of Norway will recognize what I regard as the wisdom of the Norwegian Bank in proposing a 100% divestment from all oil and gas assets. I know it's a difficult choice, but it's a smart financial choice as well as a moral and ethical choice. If I've interfered in politics, <laughs> it won't be the first time. <laughs> but at present, we see the danger, we hear the messages from Mother Nature, we have the solutions, they can be implemented. What's left to discuss? Political will. We need policies, and our current policies subsidize the burning of fossil fuels worldwide at a rate 38 times larger than the meager encouragements for the acceleration of the sustainability revolution. And of course, the fossil fuel companies and the associated businesses and institutions that have thrived along with them have a tremendous amount of political power and financial power. Will that determine the outcome of humanity's future? Or will the conscience of humanity have a role to play? We are seeing the rising generation demanding a better world. We are seeing tremendous leadership from cities around the world. Oslo will be the green capital of Europe next year. My congratulations to you, Mr. Mayor. Not only in name, but with the fantastic leadership Oslo has been providing. Many regional governments, the state of California I mentioned earlier, has now committed itself legally to be a zero carbon economy by 2045. Ireland has just announced a complete divestment as a nation of all fossil fuels. And there are many other examples. Corporations, particularly consumer-facing corporations in the global economy, are shifting quickly to 100% renewable energy and making other changes to be a part of the solution instead of being part of the problem. But time is running out. Some changes, regrettably, have already occurred that will not be recoverable, but the truly catastrophic changes that could end human civilization as we presently know it can still be avoided. Those who I most respect in the scientific community, and you will see some of them in just a moment, agree on that point. There are uncertainties on the downside as well as on the upside. And most of the reports of the last few decades have turned out in retrospect to have been far too conservative compared to the actual events that have unfolded. A global emergency, as I said at the beginning, is exactly what we confront. But I will close by saying, as I have in times past, that for those who feel the temptation to despair, remember how many great challenges have been overcome in our history at moments when advocates also felt despair, when the odds seemed piled up high against success. Look over the list of awards given here in Oslo, and you will see the names of champions who had moments when they were certain they might be failing, but who overcame 
the obstacles. And always remember that political will is itself a renewable resource. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. If we can't be 100% sure of anything, how sure is sure enough? Scientists tell us that 20,000 years ago, the Earth was about to come out of an ice age. It was significantly colder than it is today. Glacial ice, up to four kilometers thick, covered much of the northern hemisphere. Now, geologists and climatologists were not able to go back in time to observe temperatures or ice sheets directly, so it's reasonable to wonder how they can be so certain. So here's one thing I'll do. These orange circles mark scientific or historical claims. If you're viewing this online, you can pause and click a circle to hear experts explain the evidence behind it. The negative numbers here indicate how many degrees colder it was in Celsius than the late 1900s. The temperatures are estimated by looking at ice drilled out of glaciers, as well as fossils, such as shells, that hold clues about the conditions when they are formed. This particular graph comes from a study that combines 80 temperature records from different locations. The authors of the study essentially average these proxy temperatures together, weighing them differently based on location and other factors. Note that the true temperature history may not have been so smooth. Short-term variations like this or this could have occurred, but the level of precision in the underlying charts kind of blurs the image. Variations this big, however, are unlikely to have happened without leaving a mark in the natural record. As for what causes temperature changes, you may have noticed that the line has been creeping upwards. Do scientists understand why? Well, the Earth's orbit is composed of many different cycles of different duration. We experience the daily and yearly cycles in a dramatic way. But some more subtle repetitions occur over tens of thousands, even hundreds of thousands of years. And the accumulated effect of these long-term cycles tracks pretty well with evidence of ice ages. But here's where it gets complicated. These orbital changes didn't directly cause the temperatures to rise because they didn't cause more sunlight overall to hit the Earth. They did affect the angle of the sun in a way that allowed more of it to reach the poles, which caused the glaciers to retract. The melting ice triggered a chain of events, including new sea currents and an uptake of carbon dioxide. And these secondary factors ultimately cause the average temperature to rise. It's an elaborate explanation. Scientists are pretty confident they know what happened. But even when the world seems to be in clear view, the picture is always at least a little bit out of focus, obscured, distorted. Uncertainty can take many forms. And it's often hard for scientists to explain, quantify, or even know how close they are to the truth. In many cases, like when we look to the future, truth can't be derived through observation. So scientists have to use creativity to construct a possible picture of truth, then test it, sharpen it. Climatologists have built models that help them predict how different forces affect each other and impact the Earth's temperature. They grow more certain when different types of evidence agree and when their explanations survive scrutiny from other scientists. 
Let's shift gears and look at what humans were doing since the last ice age. Shrinking ice sheets allowed humans to cross a land bridge between Asia and North America. Sometimes melting glaciers would collapse, causing massive floods or abrupt sea rise. Farming would ultimately lead to the birth of civilization, which spread slowly across the globe. The earliest known empire rose in Egypt in 3000 BC. Other empires would follow. Lots of history happened through these centuries. Territories were settled, conquered, reconquered. Big discoveries would change the world. But from a core numbers perspective, the really big changes were about to happen right about here, at the Age of Enlightenment and the Industrial Revolution. Scientific thinking brought about dramatic improvements in health and technology. Our population exploded. Some might say we thrived. But population growth combined with the Industrial Revolution had environmental consequences. The amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere began rising due primarily to the burning of fossil fuels. This dark line indicates that humans started recording temperatures using thermometers, which are more reliable than ice cores or fossils. One could argue that scientists were slow to grow certain of human-caused climate change. Some studies warned of the problem well over a hundred years ago. In 1965, the U.S. President's Science Advisory Committee issued a major report stating that carbon dioxide, quote, will almost certainly cause significant changes in the temperature. Since then, the Earth's temperature has been rising. Looking back at the 20,000 years we just traveled, the recent warming does not resemble past natural changes. The uncertainty we discussed is very real, but there just doesn't seem to be enough of it to change the picture. Even compared to moments when we were exiting the Ice Age the most rapidly, Today's rate of warming is of a different magnitude. For future projections, scientists must rely on their models and make a number of assumptions, one being human behavior. This scenario by the International Panel for Climate Change assumes we make no new efforts to reduce carbon emissions, whereas this one assumes we make drastic cuts, enough to keep temperature rise to two degrees above pre-industrial levels. The gap between these scenarios highlights uncertainty stemming from human behavior. But what about other types of uncertainty in the science? Well, the IPCC projections do specify a margin of error, and there are differing opinions among scientists. This study, considered outside the mainstream, argues that the IPCC projections are too high and should be about 45% less warm, which would be great news if true but it would hardly nullify the importance of curbing emissions. Some have argued that because of uncertainty in the science, we should hold back on our efforts to fight climate change. In fact, here are examples when prominent figures have pointed to uncertainty as a reason to defer U.S. policy. Perhaps it's been an effective argument in part because certainty is hard to explain. It's tempting to ask scientists to talk more simply and forcefully about their findings, to refrain from sharing nuances that might be used against them. But that sounds like asking them to go against their training to compensate for our political failings or shortcomings as science communicators. And being too dismissive of uncertainty can play into another type of confusion, one that I personally struggle with. Defeatism. Defeatists mix up certainty with inevitability. They see the Paris goal as a hollow aspiration, not an achievable plan. 
and politics as an obstacle of positive change, not a mechanism to enable it. Defeatists confuse not depending on technology for solutions with not believing in it. And defeatists think they're smart enough to predict how humans will behave. But there isn't a field of science, not political science, game theory, sociology, or psychology that can offer us much certainty at all when it comes to a key question. What are we going to do next? What do we do next? Climate change is one of those issues that the more we study it, the more we understand, the more serious it becomes, the more complex it becomes, and the more interwoven we see that it becomes with our lives. The seriousness we see around us every day, the consequences of climate change at this one degree of global warming are already much larger than we thought they would be even just a few years ago. And for every report that the Intergovernmental Panel of, Clim of Climate Change delivers and any other body, for every report, the assessment of vulnerability gets higher. We are more vulnerable to this climate change than we thought. The complexity is highlighted at this moment by the discussions that are going on in Katowice in Poland we already heard Nobel laureate Gore say what happened when they tried to welcome the report from the IPCC. They are discussing other issues as well. What will be the global rule book? They are now discussing the details behind the Paris Agreement and they are making slow progress. And this year's Nobel laureate, Dennis Mkwege, highlighted the interwovenness of the problem yesterday in his speech when he told us that one of the things that we are really proud of here in Norway are growth in electric vehicles, we, where we think we are doing something good for climate and environment, is actually exacerbating a completely different problem that we have to see in a connected way. It is easy to despair, in particular when we are told that the emissions keep rising, things are not happening fast enough. It is easy to think that we cannot solve the climate problem, but solve it we must. And that is what we will now try to do. <laughs> so luckily I have with me here a very distinguished panel who will try to answer this question of what we will do next. Here we have Professor Catherine Hayhoe, of the, um, she's the director of the Climate Science Center at Texas Tech University. We have Director General Jose Graciano da Silva of the Food and Agriculture Organization of the UN. We have Dr. Uh, Tina Saltzet, who is Head of Sustainable Finance at the Nordea Bank here in Norway. And we have Professor Ricardo Winkelmann of the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research. My name is Bjorn Samset. I am a natural scientist and climate modeler, and I am a research director of the Cicero Institute for um, International Climate Research here in Oslo. I will address my first question to Professor Winkelmann, because First, when we have a problem, we start by figuring out what tools we have. And you work at a rather unique institution. It is a climate research institute that is not just interdisciplinary, but I think you say transdisciplinary as well. So my first question to you is really, do we have knowledge-wise the tools that we need to solve the problem? Yeah, to me, there are really two parts to this question. Um, part number one is the question, do we have enough knowledge to understand that we need to act now and we need to act fast? And the answer is yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. um, we just saw earlier an impressive account of um, all the different impacts that are already observed, that are already experienced by people around the world. Um, the second part of the question, however, uh, however is uh, I would argue that we need science and knowledge now more than ever. We urgently need more knowledge and understanding how we can mitigate, how we can adapt. And the simple and plain reason for this is we are in uncharted territory. Never have temperatures risen this fast in the history of humankind. 
And we just saw in this movie that the difference between an ice age and today's warmer interglacial was just three to five degrees. Three to five degrees distinguishing an ice age and today. So very vast difference. And right now we're facing the same kind of warming in the other direction, but at a much, much faster rate. Now, why is it so crucial that we understand these temperature differences and the impacts that come along with 1.5 versus 2 degrees versus 2.5 degrees? Why does it even matter? Well, the reason for this is that the climate system is full of nonlinearities. And um, Al Gore actually mentioned a few of them earlier. I'm just going to give you one example, uh, the Antarctic ice sheet. So Antarctica is covered by this massive ice sheet that's worth 58 meters of global sea level rise. So really a vast ice cover. But even though it's so massive, it's also very fragile. And we understand ice sheet dynamics better and better. And we also understand that there are these so-called tipping points, these critical thresholds that can determine in just a few tens of degrees whether or not an ice basin and might drain into the ocean and lead to global sea level rise. So it's these kinds of critical thresholds that we find everywhere in the climate system. So the Antarctic ice sheet is only one of the examples for tipping elements in the climate system. And really, we found that there are actually few tipping elements that are already at risk of transgressing that critical threshold within this Paris range of 1.5 to 2 degrees of warming. That makes it very relevant to pose a question that was posed to the forum on social media because we got a lot of questions in advance. So thanks to the audience who sent all those in. One uh, viewer said, if we all decided to take care of the environment, would the damage be reversible? Are we already doomed or can we at least salvage some of Mother Earth? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a really good, very important question. So of course, as my role, my role as a scientist is to lay the cards um, on the table. And yes, there are some climate impacts that might not be reversible because we have these critical thresholds in the climate system. But at the same time, and I cannot stress this enough, we live in the Anthropocene. So we're in an, an age now where humans actually have the power to change the climate system. But that also means that we should feel empowered to also reverse some of what is happening right now. And the very good news is that um, we actually know how to do it. We know which knob we need to turn. We know what, what, what we can do in order to mitigate some of these changes. Thank you. So we'll turn now to uh, Professor Hayhoe. The um, climate issue cannot be solved by someone on behalf of someone else. It concerns us all. It is a global issue. Uh, beyond being a very distinguished scientist, you are also a very active communicator, and I know that you have worked to involve groups who have traditionally maybe not been so involved in climate change or maybe even been actively opposed to it. So my first question to you is really, how do we work to get everyone on board with trying to solve this issue? Mm -hmm. That really is the question. So I'm a climate scientist also. I live in Texas. I am active on social media. And so almost every day, sometimes many times a day, I have people telling me that climate isn't changing, that it's cold outside, so the planet can't be warming, that it's just a natural cycle. Haven't I heard of the ice ages? Or my favorite, that we scientists are just doing this for the money. <laughs> you might think that these comments come from people only in the United States, but they don't. <laughs> <laughs> many of them, many of them come from my home country of Canada, more from Australia, the UK. Even here in Norway, there are people who say this and think this. So often we as scientists think they don't understand. We need more information. As we discussed the other day, we need animated graphics in our reports. Maybe that will help. But when you look at public opinion polling, even in the United States, the majority of people agree that climate is changing, that it will affect the natural environment, people who live in developing countries, future generations. But then you ask, will climate change affect me personally? And the majority says no. 
The most dangerous myth that the largest number of people have bought into is that the impacts of climate change are distant in space and time. It only matters to future generations or to people or animals who live far away. We believe that if I am not an environmentalist, if I'm not somebody who cares about the polar bears, then I'm not somebody who would care about a changing climate. But the reality is, to care about a changing climate, the only thing we need to be is a human living on this planet. The reason why we care about a changing climate is because it is, as the military puts it, a threat multiplier. It takes all of the issues we already care about and it exacerbates them, it amplifies them. The reason why I care about a changing climate is because it isn't fair. It disproportionately affects the poorest and most vulnerable people in the world. There is a direct connection between the work of the two laureates this year and a changing climate. As climate changes, it exacerbates civil conflict, resource shortage, wars, refugee crises. And who are the first to suffer when these events occur? The women and the children. But there's good news too, and that is that investing in the lives of women and children is one of the main ways that we can work to solve this problem. Because the second most dangerous myth I think that we've bought into is that the solutions do pose an imminent threat to our way of life. We are here today, I'm alive today, because of fossil fuels, because of the Industrial Revolution. So while we must be grateful for the resources, the benefits it has brought us, at the same time, what we are missing and what makes us so full of fear is that vision of a better future. We need the vision of a better future, one that is free of fossil fuels, but that still provides abundant, clean energy for all. A healthy economy, a life for ourselves and for others that is better, not worse than it is today. We have a few of these puzzle pieces already, and we've talked about some of those. The fact that where I live, wind and solar energy farms are springing up all over. The fact that pay-as-you-go solar is going through 11 countries in sub-Saharan Africa, providing energy to people who only had kerosene before. We see these changes, but they have not been assembled into a full picture of the future. And so the secret to talking to people who don't think climate change matters is not to assume that they don't have the right values and we need to help them learn or grow the right values. No. The secret is to assume, to recognize, that they already do have the right values. We just have to connect the dots between those values and the issue of a changing climate. Thank you. As a fellow natural scientist, it's very tempting to start asking you the details <laughs> of your research. Yes. <laughs> but I won't do that now. We'll do it afterwards. Uh, but I know that you spend an extraordinary amount of time synthesizing this research together with other scientists into big reports, like the very recent U.S. Uh, National Science Assessment, U.S. Climate Assessment. Have you been able to synthesize an answer from your line of research or from the other U.S.-based research? How do we solve the climate issue? <laughs> I, I am one of the lead authors of the U.S. National Climate Assessment, which was just released a few weeks ago. It documents how climate is changing, how it is already impacting us today, and how we as humans are already beginning to respond to those changes. But it also shows very clearly that we are not responding fast enough. As Ricardo pointed out, the changes that we are seeing today are so much faster than anything we have seen in the history of human civilization and far beyond that. So the question really is, how can we fix this problem? And the answer is, it is not up to us scientists alone. We need everyone. We need planners, water managers, architects, artists to give us the creative vision, policy experts, politicians, leaders. We need everyone to do this for the future of the human race. Thank you. So I now turn to um, Director General Da Silva. Food production is one of those issues that is critical for us as a society. It is one of the issues that is most affected by climate change. But we also hear that some of climate change is because of food production. Just another example of how things are interwoven. Of course, we can't stop producing food. So we have, or the UN has listed the UN Sustainability Goals, 
and they are all in some or most of them in some sense linked with climate change so I would ask, like to ask you from your role how do we deal with the interconnectedness of climate change with all these other issues of which you are working very closely with at least one well in fact they, they are uh, linked from the very beginning because in 2015 uh, when we agreed uh, with the Sustainable Development Goals, uh, that is uh, an agenda for sustainable development for humanity, for all countries, we also agreed was in Paris uh, to uh, fight climate change. So from the very beginning, they were connected. What is ironical is that, uh, for example, SDG number two is to eradicate hunger and all forms of malnutrition. Mm -hmm. that I consider the base for the whole others. If you have hunger, we will not be sustainable. Uh, so, ironically, since then, hunger is going up. We have been able to pull numbers uh, of hunger people in the world since in 1990, when it achieved around uh, one uh, billion people. We pull it down in 19, uh, 2014, below 800 million. Now it's up to 821. The last three years, it went up. And basically, it went up for two things that are connected. Conflicts, war, etc., and impact of climate change. And when both overlap, hmm, uh, like uh, happens in the Sahel or in the dry corridor in Central America, uh, we see uh, a lot of uh, uh, things getting together to uh, uh, move people around, uh, to intensify the conflict. By the way, uh, we in FAO, with the World Food Program, we address all the countries in conflict, village per village, twice a year. And we provide those numbers to the Security Council. Security Council uses as proxy of conflict number of hunger people. Food insecurity is connected, linked, mathematically to uh, war, to conflict. When you intensify the war, the conflict, hunger is there and increasing. For the future, what we see this more and more the role of the climate change promoting conflict uh, this will increase food insecurity in the world basically for three reasons uh, one is that we will not be able to produce enough for the growing population we expect uh, we will not be able to produce enough food for them uh, yields will be dropping even in irrigated areas, we are expecting all cereals to be affected with low level of production and erratic production also due to the draws and floods that alternate. Uh, but also because the food produced will be less nutritious. Mm -hmm. It is proven now that uh, with the, the level of CO2 that we have, the wheat has less proteins, less uh, minerals like zinc, for example, the uh, vitamin A that is vital for us. So nutrition will be crazy. There is an estimation from the World Bank that uh, uh, the uh, nutrition uh, 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 among children below five that's crucial for uh, the development, of future development of a child uh, will be 20% uh, 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 less possible. So it's a great impact in the future generations. We are destroying future. But also prices will be up. Mm. Estimations we made shows that the uh, uh, price of corn, for example, will be up for 30%, one third. Wheat will double the price in the future. So, more and more people will uh, not be able to afford the, the food they need. And uh, let me say that this brings up, I was looking for the, the video, and amazing you saw that uh, 
9,000 years ago, we started to farming. And we farmers know what that means, Mr. Gore. So farmer means that you don't need to, to, day after day, go after your food. You don't need to wake up and try to collect or hunt something to eat that day. You produce it. This is, was the big change of humanity. This was the beginning of civilization. Mm -hmm. hmm? Now we are bringing back this uncertainty that we don't know if we will have our food available. This is what is the change. It's a big change in, for humanity, for our future. So, you may correct me if I'm wrong, but my, my colleagues tell me that about half the world's food is produced by, by family farms, and then the other half is by more industrial processes and uh, more of the bigger concerns. But that also means that a lot of food is exported, right? It is an extremely important commodity. Will that be a security issue, do you think? When, f if food becomes scarce, prices become high, countries or the food producing countries turn more in on themselves and, and um, consolidate what they have rather than, than export? This is a question that we've gotten from some of our, our viewers. They are worried about the security situation for food. That could be a tendency. That could be a tendency. The same way that we are rejecting migration, we could uh, start to, let's say, pres try to keep the food for ourselves, mm -hmm. uh, uh, thinking that that will solve the problem. It will not solve the problem. Mm -hmm. uh, we need uh, the trade to provide food for the world. Uh, trade is a good thing in providing uh, exchange and be more efficient in production. Uh, so, uh, but on the same, uh, on the other hand, we, this, we, we, we nowadays we base our uh, uh, food basically on commodities. Four products that are maize, soybeans, rice, and wheat mm -hmm. uh, respond for 80% of what we eat around the world. We need to diversify this. This is uh, something that uh, helps to cope with climate change, diversification of production, and more local production of uh, vegetable, fruits, etc., will help also. Because the paradox is we are not only facing hunger nowadays. The epidemic that's out of control is obesity. Obesity is going rapidly, so rapidly, that we risk to have more obese people than hunger people in the world. By the way, if I ask where, in which continent obesity is growing more rapidly, I think that I would not get the, any answer for Africa. But it's there. It's in Africa that we have hunger and obesity growing faster. It's the, 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 the products that we are eating are not healthy. And climate change has a lot to, to do with this. <laughs> Thank you. So turn to Tina Saltvet. We've touched on scientists, we've touched on policymakers, we've touched on the general public. We have not yet touched on the global finance sector, which you represent, which is also, of course, crucial for finding the right solutions and um, well, pulling the right solutions through. Do you see finance actors leading the way, or does policy need to lead and then finance follow? I think this is a corporation. No doubt about that. And uh, what Mr. Gore referred to earlier today as well, we see that now when the big governments, uh, pro oil producing governments are stepping on the brakes, uh, we see the, absolute, the, uh, the opposite happening in the financial sector. They're pushing up the climate changes on the agenda. And actually now we see that insurers, we see that wealth managers are actually going together and uh, with the biggest uh, corporation we have seen so far, they're actually trying to push governments to re reduce the, uh, uh, the use of coal and also to move faster to a greener uh, energy and greener economy. So it's very interesting to see that working together, even though you are competitors from the start, that you could actually get something going. But it is important to look at the role from the financials, for the financial sector. What are we doing? What are we supposed to do? And I think the most important role for the financial sector is to put the right price uh, on, on the risk. And I think it's a growing awareness as well.
that risk connected to climate changes are growing. It's posing, posing a threat to the financial sector as such. And in the worst place, we can end up with a new crisis, a new financial crisis that we had in 2008. So how do we actually do that? How do we put a price on the risk which is connected to climate changes? First of all, I think we, we should notice that climate changes is not only the physical climate changes we're talking about. It's also risk connected with, for example, changes in policy. That could come quite fast. It could be changes in regulations. And also, very important as well, changes in consumer preferences. This could come overnight and change the way the capital is flowing very fast. Mm -hmm. So these kind of risks we have to incorporate in our models. So what's the problem actually by doing this at the moment? I think the short term way the financial market is working. We're thinking about quarterly results. We're thinking about half a year's results, annual results. But they don't necessarily pick up the changes we see in the climate in the society as such. So we need to have a longer horizon when we measure risk. And how should we do that then? I think it's important to, look, first of all, we have to look at the taxonomy, the way we are referring to things. When you talk about green, when you talk about sustainability, when I talk about green and when I talk about sustainability, it has to be the same thing. Otherwise, it's, it's confusing. It can be greenwashing. So we need to have a, a common reference of what green and sustainable is. But then we have to have goals, bold goals, because we need to see the capital moving faster. So far, it's a lot of talk, but we haven't really seen the big changes coming. So we need to have goals, we need to have a taxonomy, and we also have to measure the risk. And um, to be able to do so, I also think that we have to have a more open uh, and clear reporting so, do, so that actually you can follow up of what we are doing. And we also have to be more transparent because uh, if you're going to see where actually we are investing money, how we are managing your money, it could be your pension money, it could be your saving money, or it could be the money for big corporations and investors. You need to know what we're doing. So we need, uh, we need much more transparency to see how the capital is moving. And in that kind of sense, I think it's also important to look at how we could use technology. Imagine how good it would be if you have your mobile phone with an app. And if you push that app, you can actually see what would be the climate footprint of your portfolio. What could be the climate footprint of, for example, one corporation? Because then you could easily move <laughs> your money, the money and the capital yourself. So I think this way of using technology, be much more open and transparent, would actually make it more difficult to hide, more difficult not to move the money in the more efficient and climate-friendly direction. Okay. Thank you. So Nobel laureate Gore um, advocated for a Norwegian clear divestment from fossil fuel um, resources. Do you think that kind of, it's, it's, kind of, it, it's really a financial decision, but it's also a, a sim symbol decision. Do you think that kind of a symbol would have an effect globally? For sure. I mean, when we see the big funds, the big investors in the world are changing direction. It sets a trend. And I think it's two important, um, two important happenings that we should mention this year. First of all, the CEO of the largest investment funds in the world, the BlackRock. He came out in January this year, and it really was an eye-opener. Because what he said was that, for us, it's not enough any longer just to focus on the financial return. We also need to see a social return on our investments. And that is a very important signal. And also, we saw the CEO of the, uh, of the oil fund here in Norway, or the, the large uh, sovereign wealth fund, saying almost the same thing. And of course, when you have two big funds like that, setting such a clear direction, you will have the smaller players coming after as well. And of course, there is another risk, because you're saying that actually the cost of producing solar power, wind power, it's decreasing very sharply and very fast. Soon these uh, energy sources will be competitive without any uh, subsidies. So of course, staying in the fossil fuel for too long actually could make your investments uh, not profitable. You could actually lose your money. So it's important to get this shift in time actually to, to be profitable uh, in longer term. 
but also global, uh, global uh, climate changes. Um, of course, uh, they, they are global, they, they are infecting us, and of course, government have to have uh, a push here. But we could also do something ourselves. I mean, we as banks and financial institutions should, should also look at solutions in, in the smaller scale for the local communities to work on, because the solutions are often local. So how could we actually support, for example, solar power in the local environment? Uh, women, for example, that would help women because uh, it would make their job easily, more easy. Uh, actually, a lot of the uh, energy we're using today as well are quite polluting, so we, see, we could see that uh, we could increase the living standard of people. And how could we do that? We could have, you know, green loans for small communities. We can have impact uh, loans and impact investment for, for smaller groups. And in that way, we could try together also reducing the risk, working together with government institutions, because some kind of risk we don't like in the financial sector. That is political risk, it's also a lot of the technology risk, but if you could share the risk with a, a, a public company or a, a public fund, we could take some of the risk, the public side could take some of the risk, we could actually generate more money into to green solutions and the capital will move faster. So I think it's a lot of things we can do here. Share the burden, share the risk. Absolutely. Thank you. I would like to move now to the audience poll that has been rolling. Can we get that up on the screen? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. So the audience was asked, what is the greatest barrier to climate action? And uh, some options have been proposed. Is it the lack of knowledge about the consequences? Is it the initial cost of switching to renewable energy? Is it ineffective leadership? Is it lobbying from large corporations? Or is it other? some other issue. Looking at the results here, I think we have a clear opinion from the um, viewers and the audience that uh, ineffective leadership is something we have to tackle. Parts of our leadership is in the audience, so <laughs> do look to the poll. But um, I will pose this question now to our, our audience. I will pose you two questions at the, at, at the same time. First, what do you think is the greatest barrier to climate action at the moment? And Personally, how worried are you about the future for the Earth and for our climate? So let's go back to Professor Winkleman first. Yeah, maybe starting with your last question first. I am a stubborn optimist, but I'm a stubborn optimist for a reason. So I always listen to, to the voice of, of science, to the voice of physics, and the voice of reason um, within myself. And so I have good reason to be optimistic, and some of those reasons were actually pointed out by, by the panel just now. Um, we actually know what the solutions are, and I'm quite surprised. I mean, 10 years ago, who would have thought that, for instance, solar and wind energy would be scalable as we see it now? Who would have thought that electric vehicles would sort of uh, uh, flood, <laughs> flood the world uh, in the way that they're doing? And so um, all of those reasons are good reasons to be optimistic. And so um, while I think the, the climate problem is very severe, and calls for collective action and is something that we all need to work on. I think it's important to also point out that we have good reason to believe in these solutions and to be optimistic. Thank you. Dina? Well, first of all, if, um, if you look at governments, I think, uh, or, or leadership, I think it's also a bit of short-termism within leadership and governments. Because often politicians, they're elected for a certain period of time. And uh, the same with boards. Boards are also elected often for a certain period of time. And you don't be, want sometimes to be too radical. Because if you're too radical, you make too large changes. Uh, maybe you're not elected the next time. So in that kind of way, I think this short-term thinking is not only in the financial industry, but it could also be a bottleneck within the politics in, and uh, also in the boardroom. And that's why we have to end that. We have to rethink the way we're actually thinking about uh, uh, climate and risk. But moving on to the second question, right? so much happening in the financial sector now, it really gives me hope. And it's also fun to work with because it's an important sector to actually get the shift going. And it's fun to do this because we have to set a new direction. We have to close the gap uh, and we have to align 
uh, our financial business models with the Paris Agreement and with the United Nations uh, uh, requirements. So I think, you know, I'm optimistic that this is changing and actually see, you know, the push coming now from the financial sector. And in that way, I hope we have a good steam here. Thank you. Dr. General. I would choose the one of the orders there, because I, I believe that the, what we are facing now is a lacking of funds, financial constraint. Uh, if you take, a, for example, I'll, I'll step again on Mr. Gore. Uh, the simple things to do is plant a tree. Hmm? Uh, FAO has a project to uh, what we call Great Green Wall, it's to plant forests in the borders of the desert. More than 20 years that we have this project in the Sahel, and we don't have money. It's a very simple project. We collect the seeds from the trees that are local, that survive in the border of the desert. We multiply them, and then using women, local people, we plant the trees. We don't have fund for that project. And I can tell you many stories like that, that we don't have fund to mitigate or to adapt. And it's very costly. We estimate that uh, adaptation for agriculture sectors, what include crops, animals, and forests, uh, would cost basically seven billion, at least dollars per year, and uh, mitigation would cost four to five times more than that. So, talking about thirty-five, forty billion dollars. What, what we have now? The Green Climate Fund, yeah, $10 billion in 2015. Not uh, even uh, we put the money there, only about uh, six to seven. And now it has less than $2 billion to finance all adaptation and mitigation, the word that costs basically at least $50 billion a year. If we don't have the funding, we will not be able to do anything. Small farmers are very poor. They cannot afford to adapt. They will not survive just that. They will move to the cities and will complicate even more the problem. It sounds like you're worried. Very worried. Yes. Because we are seeing this rural urban migration again, back again. These people that's coming from Guatemala, uh, they are uh, rural people, most of them, that moved to the city, didn't find a way to survive them, and they, they are trying to find a way to survive. Our uh, last research in Africa about migration, we found that those that move from the countryside to the city and cannot find a job what's the majority, move out of the country, move to Europe, young people especially. If they, are, if they can cross the desert of the Sahara, it's not the Mediterranean that will stop them. If we want to stop migration, we need to develop there, in their countries, rural development. This is something that we forgot to talk about. That's what we need, and that needs money, investment. It's all about that. Thank you. Professor Heyo, you get the last word of this panel. What is the greatest barrier to climate action? As I said, I'm convinced that the most dangerous myth that the largest number of people have bought into is the myth that the impacts don't pose a threat to us personally, but the solutions do. So my answer to the poll would be yes. We lack knowledge. Part of the reason we lack knowledge is consistent lobbying from large corporations. If we lack the knowledge, why would we push our leaders to do something that we ourselves are not sure about? And why would we have funds if we have not pushed our leaders to do so? All of these, though, come down to a simple issue, a very basic and human issue, the issue of fear. We're presented with bleak and dismal, almost apocalyptic views of the future. 
a future where cities are drowned, where sea levels are rising, where extreme heat wipes out entire regions' agriculture. But we're also painted a vision of the future where we return to the Middle Ages, or even worse, the Stone Ages, with no electricity and uh, no comfortable lives like we have today. So in terms of my optimism, I strive not for fear, but for rational hope. We need to understand the magnitude of the problem that confronts us. But fear holds us back. Fear paralyzes us. Fear causes us to cling to the past and to resist change. We need to go out and look for the hope that will maintain long-term action that we need to fix this problem. And that hope already exists, but we need that picture of a better future to strive towards. And that is what will get us going and what will keep us going as long as we need to to fix this. Thank you. We have reached the end of our allotted time on stage. I wish to thank all my co-panelers for your really excellent insights. I hope we managed to um, at least open your minds to the complexities of the issue if we didn't manage to find the final solution. We also thank, of course, Nobel laureate Al Gore for your excellent introduction. And with that, we call an end to this year's Nobel Peace Prize Forum. Thank you all. <laughs>